Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I am back to continue my series on the science behind why we humans may in fact be able to, and in many cases are able to, hear the differences between audio cables. And so this is part three where we will talk about AC signal transmission. In the description below, I will put links to parts one where I talked about what science is and what measurements are, and part two where I talked about waves and wave superposition. Uh, and then I will also put a bunch of links down uh, in there for the stuff that I use in this slideshow, some of the sciencey things in here, because I got a level with you off the top here that AC signal transmission is wiggy. Like it gets weird and there's a lot to it and it's very complicated. What I have done in this video here is try to break it down into the simplest terms possible and strike a balance between giving you enough information to kind of sort of understand what's going on, but also not overwhelm uh, just the lay audience here on YouTube. So to the scientists and the electrical engineers who may be out there watching this, please keep in mind that you are not the intended audience. So I may not say everything exactly the way you think it should be said, but I'm just trying to capture the main idea in the kind of language that most people will understand. All right. And then also please remember quickly that we are talking mostly about analog signal cables in this series. So things like RCA and XLR interconnects, the kind of cables that go between say your DAC and your preamp or your amplifier, and then things like speaker cables and headphone cables. All right, a quick citation for the uh, website where I got this cool slide background. So see Slides Carnival for some cool PowerPoint backgrounds. Previously in this series, again, I just mentioned, we talked about what is science in part one, and then we also talked about waves uh, in part two. And remember that a wave is how energy travels through space and time. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a sound wave or a seismic wave or an electromagnetic wave or a wave of light, which is also an electromagnetic wave. They, all of that, all of those are examples of energy moving through space and time. And we also talked about wave superposition and how even when you pluck a single string on a single instrument, you get lots of different wave information going on in that uh, instrument string vibrating back and forth. You get the fundamental frequency of that string. In other words, the tone that it's intended to play. But then you also get other wave information on that string that is of higher frequency than that fundamental frequency. And all of those waves are traveling through the same space at the same time. And they are adding together to give us something that looks like this where we see a pattern of larger oscillations, but then on top of those larger oscillations, we see smaller ones too. Okay, so again, I talked about this in depth in part two. Uh, please go back and look at that if you don't uh, remember or didn't watch. In this video, we're gonna talk about the fact that audio circuits are alternating current though, or AC for short. And one way that we can tell that is if you look at the back of an amplifier, particularly a speaker, a speaker amplifier, this is clearly visible where we get these uh, speaker terminals here, usually two for each channel. One of them will be red and the other will be black or one of them will be labeled plus and the other one will be minus or some combination of those things so that we can tell the difference between which terminal is which. And the reason that we have two connections there is that the amplifier creates energy differences, which we call voltages that flip back and forth, meaning each terminal for each channel spends half of the time it's doing amplifying duties being the positive or the high energy side and half the time being the negative or the low energy side and which one that is flips back and forth. So each terminal really is the high energy terminal for half of the music signal and it's the low energy ter uh, terminal for half of the energy signal. And it's in that back and forth direction there where we can change the direction that current flows. Now current, electric current, is going to flow from high energy to low energy, 
but the amplifier or an audio amplifier is changing where the high energy and low energies are all of the time so that the current keeps switching back and forth traveling different directions and this is how we can get a speaker to vibrate back and forth more on that in just a moment all right so remember uh in a previous video here it was the wave video we talked about how when a disturbance happens in our atmosphere just in the air okay like playing an instrument we create this compression wave that travels through space like this right and we can and that's mechanical energy okay we have vibrations we have moving stuff so energy is traveling through space and time mechanically in this situation now we have devices like microphones which can take that mechanical energy and and convert it into electromagnetic energy specifically an electrical signal and that electrical signal is going to be oscillating intensities of electromagnetic energy which we can model with a sine wave all right so then the frequency or the pitch of those mechanical vibrations that are traveling through the air as a sound wave will get trans will get uh, transformed into an electromagnetic wave that has oscillating energy and then the frequency of that electromagnetic wave meaning how many ups and down humps it has in the sound wave per amount of time will be equal to the frequency or the pitch of the sound wave that occurs there then further downstream up oh, that may have cut off in the slide transition so let me start that again further downstream from that electromagnetic energy coming from the microphone we've run it through an amplifier but eventually we send it through a speaker or a headphone driver something of that nature a headphone driver is basically just a small speaker works the same way so what's happening here is we are putting that electromagnetic energy that keeps changing dire directions and it keeps changing directions at the same frequency of the pitch of the sound that we're trying to hear and when it travels through a speaker one way it pushes the speaker cone out when it travels through uh, the the speaker another way it pulls the speaker cone back in and so then the speaker starts to vibrate at the same frequency as the electrical signal that's coming into it which is of course the same frequency of the sound wave that created that electrical uh, signal to begin with okay now it is important to remember that electric charge is energy and that energy moves from high potential to low potential and we're used to this anytime you see an object sliding down a hill like this panda that's having a good old time sledding on its own back down a hill here it moves from where energy is high at the top of the hill to where energy is low at the bottom of the hill all right the flow of charge or a current is energy and that current is doing the same thing it is moving from an area of high energy to an area of low energy or high potential to low potential all right then electrical circuits are what we humans have figured out or i mean they're a way that we humans have figured out to move energy to where we want it to be to do a thing that we want it to do such as in this example where we want to take electric energy stored in a battery and put it through a light bulb so that we get light right so what happens then is in any circuit we have a high electric potential energy part of a power source we have a low electric potential energy part of a power source and then we have a flow of energy which we call the current where that energy which is carried along the electrons usually although this picture uses what we call a conventional current that's not important but the important part here is that the electrons or the charges in the wire are carrying this energy from the battery around the circuit and then when that energy gets to the light bulb we have a conversion of energy it goes from one form of electromagnetic energy as the current in the wire to another form which is light but of course light bulbs also give us heat and things like that so this is an example of of a circuit we humans develop circuits and all they really do it's worth repeating is they take 
energy, they move energy to a place we want it to be to do a thing that we want it to do. All right, but how does that energy move through stuff? Okay, that is a tricky and interesting question. Some materials allow for energy to flow more readily than others, and we call these materials conductors. Now, what makes a conductor a material through which energy travels easily? All right, here is an example of a material that we consider to be a good conductor, and this is copper. This is a model of a single copper atom. And what we see here is, of course, at the center. I mean, you remember back to grade school chemistry, you have the nucleus of the atom where all of the protons and neutrons hang out at the center, and then we have all of these electrons orbiting around the nucleus around it. Well, these outermost electrons, we call the valence electrons. And it turns out that in conductors, which are typically metals, so things like copper, silver, iron, nickel, Okay, stuff that you find in the middle of the periodic table mostly. Okay, but those things, they do not hang on to their valence electrons very strongly. And they are willing, often willing, to let them go. Where do they go? Well, let's say that we have a large chunk of copper, just a large sample of copper material. Those valence electrons will just kind of float around inside that copper sample moving from atom to atom or just hanging out in the space between atoms just kind of floating around in there all right and so any good conductor has lots of these electrons and we call them free electrons okay so again what is a good conductor it is a material that has lots of free electrons so then when we put an energy differential across these conductive materials which we call a voltage, right? We can tell those free electrons how to move. And they are gonna move from what looks like high potential energy for them to what looks like low potential energy for them. In this image, we see uh, the flow going from negative to positive, but remember electrons are negatively charged, so they do the opposite of things. So that's why the positive looks like low energy for an electron. Okay? But the point is, good conductors have lots of free electrons. If we put an energy differential across the conductor, which we call a voltage, those free electrons will start to move from what looks like the high energy side for them to what looks like the low energy side. Now, the actual movement of those electrons is more of a chain reaction. They don't just go zipping through the conductor. Okay, so what happens then is from the power source, like a battery or your wall outlet or something like that, okay, the energy differential will force an electron onto the wire or the conductor at one end, which sets up a chain reaction that pushes the next free electron closest to it over to the next atom which then pushes another electron from there over to the next atom, which pushes another electron from there over to the next atom, and so forth, such that for every electron that comes onto the conductor at the high energy side, the uh, another electron gets pushed off the connector at the low energy side, like what we see in this animation here. So the electrons themselves actually don't travel down the wires very quickly, but what does travel down the wire quickly is the energy. So remember, an electron is a charged particle. That electric charge is a form of energy. So if you bring one electron, one little bit of energy on at one end, and then that almost immediately pushes another electron off at the other end, what you have is a really quick transfer of energy through the conductor, okay, even though the electrons themselves are moving rather slowly. Resistance is not futile. Sorry to the Borg, right? They're just gonna have to deal with it. Here's what I mean by this. When we talk about electrical circuits, we have to talk about this thing called resistance. And what is resistance? 
It literally is making it more difficult for energy and electrons to flow down a wire. Okay, it resists current, makes it harder for current to flow. Why does this happen? Few reasons. What we see in this animation here with the little light blue dots is a bunch of free electrons trying to move across an energy difference in a sample of a conductor. You can think of this as like looking at a wire, okay? Zoomed in really close on a wire if you want. What makes the flow of energy here difficult are the physical dimensions of the wire, okay? Like what kind of diameter does it have? How much space do these things have to actually get through? But then, in addition to that, we still have to remember that there are a lot of positively charged nuclei in there because everything is made up of atoms. So even though good conductors have a lot of free electrons that we can get to move around, okay, they are still have a lot of the nuclei of the atoms left in the middle. Now those atoms are now ions, but that's not really the important part. We've got chunks of matter literally sitting in the way of these electrons trying to move through the conductor. And so we'll see some of these electrons, they bang into those nuclei and they bounce back or they get knocked off course. And then of course, we've got a bunch of free electrons trying to get through there also knocking into each other. Right, so all of that working together, the physical constraints of the size of the conductor, the fact that there's a bunch of little bits of matter in there that are in the way and so forth, they, the, all of that works together to create what we call resistance. Okay? It makes it more difficult for energy to flow through this wire. There is another consequence to having charges in motion, to having an electric current, and that is the magnetic field. If you put charges in motion such that we have a current, then a magnetic field will set up around that wire, kind of like what we see in this picture here. So you'll have this cylindrically shaped magnetic field running down the length of a long straight current carrying wire. And you can actually test this. If you get a, a stretch of wire pull it into as straight a line as you can, put a current through it, and then hold a compass, like a navigation compass up near the wire, you'll see something like this. When current flows through the wire, all of the needles will align in this circular pattern around the wire like this. Okay, so those are the basics of just how current flows. We haven't even talked about alternating current yet. Like I said, there is a lot to this and a lot that needs to be understood. So back to alternating current then, or AC. What we do with alternating current is we keep changing which side of the conductor is the high energy side and which side is the low energy side. We alternate those things, okay? And that forces the free electrons in the conductor to keep changing the direction they want to go. Okay, or at least the direction they're told to go. And so what ends up happening is the electrons themselves end up moving very little, but remember they are carrying energy. So the energy that is the signal that we want to transmit through this wire still moves pretty quickly in either direction, even though the electrons themselves mostly just stay in the same spot and wiggle back and forth. So again, it's worth remembering here that this is what's going on in the wire leading up to a speaker. And then of course the speaker will vibrate back and forth at the same frequency as the change in directions of the electrons or the signal, okay, the, uh, the voltage in the signal coming in. And of course that voltage in the signal will alternate back and forth, which is the high energy and which is the low energy side at the same frequency as the pitch of the sound we're trying to reproduce in an audio circuit. Remember though that audio signals are complex. Remember I showed you this graph. This is the a one pluck of one bass guitar string from one song. And what we see here are bigger oscillations, which I'll highlight in red here, but then riding on top of those are these smaller wiggles. Right, so when in, in, in an audio circuit, this signal 
is transmitting down a wire so that the electrons in, inside the wire and all of that, they are making big oscillations for the bigger signals that you hear. But as they are doing that, they are also having small wiggles back and forth that are the smaller vibrations that we see in this wave here. So this is where we really need to think carefully about audio cables though, because they are transmitting a lot of things at a lot of different frequencies all at once. There are some properties of wires, conductors, and cables that we need to discuss. The first is resistivity. Resistivity, or the reciprocal of which we call the conductivity, all right, but resistivity is a material's natural resistance to current flowing through it. All right, every material out there has its own resistivity. Copper has one, silver has one, okay. Plastics have another one entirely, but every single material in existence has its own unique, natural, naturally occurring resistance to energy flowing through it, and we call that resistivity. Another thing we need to worry about is this thing called capacitance. Simply stated, capacitance is stored energy. If you store energy in a wire, you make it more difficult for energy to be transmitted through the wire, okay? And wire or conductor, those terms I've kind of been using interchangeably here, but that's what we mean here. Okay, so capacitance is the storing of energy in your conductor, which makes it more difficult to send energy signals through there. Inductance is very similar to resistivity or resistance in a way. It involves current. Now, resistance on its own is a, it, it resists current, makes current harder to move through a conductor. Inductance resists changes in current. So it's not just that it's resisting the current, it's resisting changes in current, right? And that becomes of particular concern when we constantly change the current, such as we do in AC circuits or audio circuits. Now, the resistance, the capacitance, and the inductance all work together to create this new quantity we call the impedance. And impedance is a lot like, it, well, impedance is to AC circuits, what resistance is to DC circuits, okay? It is the load that is placed on the AC power source. How difficult is it for the AC signal to get through, okay? That's impedance. Then there's this thing called skin effect, right? We just talked about inductance there a moment ago and the fact that traveling electric currents create magnetic fields. The skin effect results from the, from the fact that when AC si uh, signals change directions, they are inducing magnetic fields that are also changing directions. But the net result on the charge carrying particles, the electrons, is that those magnetic fields push them out to the outer diameter of the conductor or the wire. So the higher the frequency gets, the more the signal travels on the skin of the conductor rather than through the center of it. And then skin depth is how deep into the wire or the conductor the signal is traveling. This needs a picture. All right, so imagine a cylindrical piece of wire that we're going to look at on end. If we put a DC signal through it, not even a signal, just put a direct current flow of energy through it, all of the current is gonna flow through the entire cross section of that wire. As we increase the frequency of an AC signal though, what's gonna happen is that more and more of the signal is going to get pushed towards the outer part of that conductor, okay? That's the skin effect happening, but how far it's pushed out from the center is known as the skin depth. For audio signals in what we call the audio band from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, it turns out that we need pretty much the entire cross-sectional area of the conductor to get them through there. But the low frequencies are gonna travel closer to the center 
okay, the higher frequencies, your treble, okay, that's going to travel closer to the outside edge of the conductor. Now, all of these things, oh, there's one more. There's also what we call dielectric properties of conductors. Like, not every little single bit of a conductor is necessarily conducting. There can be impurities in it, which the impurities themselves may not be very conductive. Sometimes we need to wrap wires in insulation. The material that we put around them is called a dielectric. Different dielectric materials, different materials that are not good conductors, also have properties that affect signals in different ways. Right, so those also matter when we talk about cable creation and cable design. Now, all of these things, it is important to note, every single one of these physical, scientifically known about for over a century, basically, or at least many, many decades, all of these things vary with frequency. They also will vary with material and cable construction. You get different amounts of all of these things, depending on whether you're talking about a copper conductor or a silver conductor or an aluminum conductor with a copper coating or a copper conductor with a silver coating or any number of other things. And then if you have multiple threads of metal conductor, like multiple little pieces of wire that you use to make a complete cable, how do you weave them together? Is it a round weave? Is it a square weave? Do you not weave them at all? And do you just let them sit next to each other? Okay, all of those things start to have an effect on these physical properties that we have known about for decades. Then the takeaway here is that all of these things will work together to varying degrees that vary with frequency, that vary with material, that vary with construction, and they will change the speed at which different frequencies travel through the conductor. Okay, so literally what I am saying here is that these properties and a couple others that I didn't think need to be mentioned, but these are enough to get the point across, okay, all of these properties here affect how quickly a 100 hertz signal will travel differently than they will affect how quickly a 1000 hertz signal will travel will affect differently how fast a 10,000 hertz signal will travel okay those will all travel at different speeds down the wire and yeah this has been measured all right, what we see here is a graph, and if you follow the link that is down in the lower left-hand corner, which I will reproduce down in the description if you wanna do more reading on this, is we see some actual measurements uh, of a wire in what's technically a transmission line. So an audio cable is not a transmission line, and so the graph will be even more chaotic looking than, than this usually. Still predictable, just won't look even as clean as this one does, right? Uh, but what we see here is two logarithmic scales. On the uh, horizontal, we have frequency. On the vertical axis, we have percentage of the speed of light. And this is a graph of what we call velocity factor. Okay, How fast is a signal traveling down a real conductor as a percentage of the speed of light in a vacuum? That is what the velocity factor is. Okay. Now these axes are logarithmic, so they might be a little bit hard to read. So let's look at this a little bit. Between these two arrows, we have the audio band. The one on the left is 20 hertz. The one on the right is 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. These are generally considered to be the limits of human hearing. Notice how much our graph, the velocity factor changes between those two frequencies. Here is one kilohertz or 1000 hertz, which is kind of smack dab in the middle of the vocal range, right? Very important for audio and audio reproduction. If we trace that point over to the vertical axis to figure out how fast this part of the signal travels, it's about 15% of the speed of light in a vacuum. The first harmonic of this one kilohertz 
tone will occur at 2 kilohertz or 2000 hertz. That's about right here on this graph. Trace that across and that signal is going to travel at about 20% of the speed of light. That means that the information, the signal that carries the first harmonic will arrive before the information that's carrying the fundamental frequency. Okay, let's look at this. How, what's that difference? The speed of light in a vacuum, which we call C in physics, is about 300 million meters per second. That's 186,000 miles per second. That's moving pretty fast, okay? Using the data we just took off of that graph, for that wire, the one kilohertz wave is gonna travel at about 45 million meters per second, still pretty fast. The two kilohertz wave is gonna travel at about 60 million meters per second. Using the very simple physics equation, speed is equal to distance over time and solving for time, such that time is equal to distance divided by speed. And then saying, hey, let's figure out how long it takes each of these one and two kilohertz signals moving at these speeds to travel down one meter length of this cable. What we find is that the one kilohertz wave is going to travel at or is going to take 22 nanoseconds to travel through this one meter of cable. The two kilohertz wave is going to take 17 nanoseconds to travel down one meter of wire. Now that's a difference of five nanoseconds. That is not very much time. Okay, that is really, really small amount of time. And if you were to tell me, hey, wave theory, humans cannot perceive a dis difference of five nanoseconds in time, I will agree with you if we are talking about two distinct sounds, like say two clicks repeated one after another with a five nanosecond gap in between them, I don't think human brains will pick that out. I don't think they'll hear that. But remember that all of this wave information in an audio signal has a context. And that context is traveling as an electromagnetic wave made up of a bunch of different frequencies all existing in the same space at roughly the same time. Okay, remember wave superposition. That's this, okay? What I've done here in this graph is I've put uh, in the red sine wave at, top, at the top, I have a given frequency. The blue wave just below that is twice that frequency. So it's like looking at a, a fundamental frequency in the red and its first harmonic, which is double that red frequency in the blue. And then I've made the amplitude of the blue wave a little bit smaller than the red wave to try to mimic what happens in real life because the harmonic frequencies generally are not as loud as the fundamental frequency. Okay, they're not as intense. But the two of them add together to create the magenta wave at the bottom. That's wave superposition. That's what I talked about in part two of this series. If you don't remember that, go back and watch part two, okay? But what's happening here is if we allow, if, if a conductor, okay, there's not even a question of allow because this happens. If the conductor allows the higher frequency a signal to travel faster than the lower frequency signal. It's like changing the graph to this. It's shifting the, the higher frequency information over just a little bit, a little bit further in time, so to speak. And remember that different wire materials and different cable constructions will change the amount that this shifts, okay? It's not a universal shift for every material and every wire construction or every cable construction, okay? But in this illustration, that's gonna change the magenta wire that we see at the bottom to something like this. Now, please forgive me, I traced this out freehand, okay, to try to illustrate that, but I think it gets the point across. And what we see here is that that wave has changed because of the shift of the blue ahead of the red 
they, the two waves now add together a little bit differently, which changes the shape of the resultant wave. So even though we might have a shift in the nanoseconds in the time domain, because of wave superposition and lots of different waves adding up now differently than they did before, this we might be able to hear because what we see here is different amplitude wave. We see that that little hump in the middle is now at a different place, definitely at a different place, and it's taller. We see that the maximum humps on either side of it are shorter and so forth, okay? The take home message that I'm getting at here is that different frequencies of electromagnetic signal, which we will hear as different pitches of sound, travel through real world conductors at different speeds. The same thing happens with light because light and electrical signals traveling in a wire are really the same thing. They are just at very different frequencies. They're both electromagnetic energies. So we've seen this before numerous times. If you take white light, which is the superposition of all of the colors out there, and we shine it on a prism, that prism changes the speeds of the individual co colors enough that it separates them out and we see the colors of the rainbow. I also see the album cover for Dark Side of the Moon, which is why we have the bad pun as the slide title here. Okay, but that's what happens, right? And this really, so all of the things that I described before, the resistivity, the capacitance, the inductance, the skin effect, the skin depth, all of those things are all little dials that you can think about turning that change the amount at which these different frequency signals change speeds and sort of get spread out like this, okay? Meaning, that the superimposed waveform that came into the conductor on one end is going to be a little bit different on the out end because of all of these shifting time alignments. And the amount at which that shifting happens depends on the material of the wire, depends on the construction of the cable, it depends on the capacitance, it depends on the resistivity, it depends on the inductance, it depends on the skin effect and the skin depth, and all of those things, they all matter. So what a good, competent cable manufacturer is going to try and do, okay, is one of two things. They're gonna take this sloped curve in the audio band that was from this example wire. And again, these are real measurements that happened, real measurements, okay? They're gonna take that sloped part, part there in the uh, audio band and they're gonna try to flatten it out. Okay, and so what they're going to do is they're going to adjust the capacitance by building the cable differently. They're going to adjust the resistivity by picking different materials. They're going to adjust the inductance by also picking different materials. Okay, they're, and you're going to play with all of those things so that they can try to flatten that part of the curve out between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz so that there are smaller time shifts in the waves. The other thing that they might do, and this is completely valid, is not necessarily try to flatten this out, but try to get certain frequency ranges to flatten out and others to not flatten out, just to create an intentional coloring to the sound. That approach is valid too, but I think for most of the high-end cable manufacturers out there, the goal is going to be to flatten this curve out and create as little time shifting as they can. Right, and that's really what it's all about here with these cables. It's about time alignment. Different frequencies will arrive at the next step in the signal chain at different times because different frequencies of electromagnetic signals travel through conductors at different speeds. Then, due to wave superposition, the adding of those wave energies together, okay, this will change the waveform that is perceived by the listener from whatever it was in its original state. Then the amount of that change varies with, again, the cable material. Are we talking about copper, silver, iron, you know, copper coated aluminum, silver coated copper, any of those things. The length of the cable matters here too. 
Remember that five nanosecond difference that I talked about for a one meter cable length? Well, you double the cable length to two meters, that's now a 10, sec 10 nanosecond difference. You make that a three meter cable, it's a 15 nanosecond difference, okay? And then of course we have cable construction. All of those things matter. The perceived waveforms all have different patterns, okay? That word pattern there is really important. And that is important because these shifts that we just talked about are small. We are usually talking nanoseconds of difference and those are tiny. So it is a fair question, can we hear them? And that is where I think we need to talk about how the human brain recognizes things like words and music and all of that when we talk about pattern recognition. Okay, so in the next installment of this series, I'm going to talk about what goes on between our ears and how our brains can pick up on this thing that we call music in the first place. All right, so I will end it there. Thanks for watching. This has been part three of my cable science video about how humans can in fact hear differences in audio cables. And we talked about AC signal transmission here. Please join me next time for part four, human pattern recognition. And as always, if you have not already, please like and subscribe to my channel. And as always, enjoy the music.